Welcome to Unleashed, where MMA icon and power wrestling titan Dan the Beast Severn and Eric Carroll deliver a knockout punch of raw, unfiltered talk. Unleashed. Gear up. Gear up. It's Beast Mode. There. It sure has, and uh, I'm almost mad at you. Your hair is whiter than mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we still have some hair left, my friend. Let's put that's, it that way. That's a good point <laughs> as well, yes. <laughs> now, I, I, on a funny note, though, all during my professional wrestling career, all during my entire fight career, my hair was colored. My mustache was colored because I, I knew, well, again, from a competitor standpoint, I don't want to look old and feeble walking into a cage. Right. So it's kind of, if I kept it dark and dastardly, oh, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I always tell people that I took certain psychology elements from professional wrestling and I brought it over to the cage fighting world because it was all the way in how you walked to that yeah. to that ring to that cage. It was all body language. I'm telling you a story with my body language. I'm telling you a story with my facial expression. I'm telling you a story with what I'm wearing. I mean, I had this gray shirt. It was it had a soak. It looked like a ring of sweat soaked around it. Great. I took a glass of water. You know, spilled around there. You, throw you had that hands. attitude. You yeah, I mean, but, but, just, yeah. but when you walk up there, you put on that good game face and stuff like that. People are like, going, oh my God, you know, it's. Uh, you mentioned the facials and the body language, and that's one of the things I miss today. These kids, mm -hmm. they don't, it's about big spots, you know? Well, it's not just, just one spot. I mean, I, I hate to even be on a show anymore because it's like, going, I can't. I always told, told my whoever I was working with that night, if I actually climb up onto the second rope, Attack me now because I don't want to get. I, I don't want to start screaming, screaming, and crying like a little boy. That when I get to the top, because it's I don't I don't know what I'm going to do with if I if I climb to the top. <laughs> These guys are taking bumps that I'd have I'd have turned down no matter how young or what kind of shape I was in. I say absolutely. Well, I think there's a lot of guys ten times tougher than me from our generation that would have said absolutely not. Are you nuts? <laughs> I mean, well, you you hit on a great point. How long of a career do you think they'll have by doing all these high risk maneuvers? How long of a career do you have? It's certainly going to shorten it. That's for sure. Well, yes. you know, uh, it's like the diving headbutt. Harley always said, if I could turn the clock back, and one thing I'd never do again is a diving headbutt. He said that after five back surgeries. Oof. Yeah. Oh, 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 he finally said it after only five. Yeah, only five. Yes. <laughs> I said, when I tell some of these young kids that they'll say, okay. And they'll go right ahead and do it anyway. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think caused that change in the, uh, the business to make it want to be all about these high spots and where that, where that storytelling really started to become the, you know, second thing they looked at? Well, I think part of it is when they, the general public, uh, became aware that everything was predetermined. Yeah. Right? I think I, you know, I, I, I can't get one of these young guys to say this to me, but I think when I watch them in the ring, like I say, all of my, all the details are missing, right? Body language. Well, they do things Dan can tell you. Well, like if I hang Dan in the corner and punch him a couple of times, then I run 20 feet to the other corner. I think, why the hell is he still there when I come back? Right. Yeah. I, I in, in training sessions, I've told kids, I said, look, uh, if I'm, you hang me in that corner, you either tie me to the ropes or make sure I'm unconscious because you run 20 feet from me. I'm 83 years old, but I damn sure won't be there when you get back. <laughs> I like that. I like that kind of attitude there. Les. That's, that's great. It's logic. It's missing is a big part of it. Right. Well, uh, less logic doesn't principally pertain to professional wrestling when you look at the current world that we live in i think uh i think stupidity somehow has whacked a lot of people on top of the head right there common I sense agree with left, that says common sense has left the building 83 <laughs> years old and you're still in the business and training that is a, one hell of a career My how life. did you keep it going that long i turned pro i was 19 when i turned pro i okay. fell in love with the business at age nine in front of a 10 inch black and white screen and uh, that's all I want. Well, I shouldn't say that's all I want to do. My second love was drag racing. 
I okay. drove my first drag car when I was 15 years old before I had a license to drive on the street. So really, after I started wrestling the first couple of years, after I left Boston is where I trained uh, and moved back to Cincinnati, uh, I would be sure to be in Cincinnati for the racing season. And then as the years progressed, we didn't get enough sponsorship to move up in the racing. So I said, OK, got to give that up and I'll stick with wrestling. Now, if we'd have got a big sponsorship, it might have gone the other way because I did. I love right now. I turn on drag racing on ESPN or something. My hands will get sweaty. I hear them pipe those open headers and <laughs> smell that. I, I almost smell that rubber smoke, right? Damn. Yeah, yeah, but do you think, yeah, okay, because you, you've got good hearing now. Do you think you'd have that same good, good hearing if you're part of that pit crew or something like that? Because I can't believe when they start revving those engines, it's like, going, oh my God, I'd be wearing earplugs. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably true as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The name of several of my wrestling, uh, my wrestling, my race cars were the Rassler, R A S S L E R. No, oh, I like I get it. And it had a cartoon of a of a wrestler, you know, on on the and across the trunk. If you if I happen to be at the end of that quarter mile ahead of you, you could read you have just been wrestlerized. So, <laughs> I love it. Always a gimmick, right? Les, who was the first one when you was watching that black and white TV? What was the first wrestler to really catch your eye? Buddy Rogers, Nature Buddy Boy. Rogers, Buddy Rogers, Nature Boy. The original my, Nature Boy. My childhood idol. I, you know, if I think of anything in the business that I wish I had a, had a chance to do and never did, was wrestle Buddy just one time. What was it about Buddy that made him so special, Les? Well, to me as a kid, and I think it's the same, it would be the same now if he were still active and in shape. When he walked that aisle, you knew he was special. Yeah. I mean, the way he, well, Dan was talking about his attitude, right? The way he carried himself. And you realize back when there were no tanning beds, that son of a gun was always tan. I, I don't know if he just would fly to Florida for a couple of weeks and then fly home or what. But, and of course, the bleach blonde hair, Dan and I could be buddy now, right? We don't even need to use the product. <laughs> we, we'll form our own tank team here, Les. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, yeah. And you know, it's funny. Uh, I never ended up in a territory. I, I have never actually met the man, but I have a, a picture that was taken in the old music hall in Cincinnati at the matches. I was 12 years old and standing next to Buddy. My dad took the picture. So, nice. Yeah, that, that's a great, uh, you know, souvenir for me. What I mean, when, you, when you're going up to Les, did you participate in other types of uh, like sports in high school or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Baseball, football, basketball. There was in Cincinnati when I was in high school, which uh, in the 50s, the public high schools had no amateur wrestling. Oh, really? Oh, wow. no. And actually, the YMCA's, there were two YMCA's that were within logistically, there was nothing close to my home, but a couple nearby, you know, maybe a, a 45 minute drive or something. But they had, uh, the one had a, a, a part time coach and the other one had nothing. They had a, they had a room with mats. And you go in there by yourself and jump around or with somebody. So what little amateur background I got was at, at the YMCA's. And uh, so, but you know what, what's missing? They were talking about training. When I went to move to Boston in February, 1960 to start my career and start training. Uh, I believe wrestling was real. I mean, I yeah. didn't expect it to be any, any other way. And today these kids don't have that work ethic when they sign up for a school because it's all a show. I can be an actor, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, and I've talked to a couple of guys who are still running full-time uh, schools and they're saying, man, it's, it's tough because some of these kids, Oh, I've got a hangnail or I, a little injury here. Right. I got to take the day off. All right. You know, this is, and, and they want to do the cool spots. We got to do the big spots. Right. And what they don't understand is the little things make the big things believable. It's what ties the big things together is where the story. And that's the other thing, too. They don't tell a story for the most part. I think today, if I were starting a promotion, if I had to Im uh, imitate somebody, be, w be the bloodline in WWE. That's been story's been ongoing for over two years now and has developed new stars and the whole nine yards. And that's what, that's as old school as it's going to get again. Sure. 
I was just about to ask you that if there was anybody in the current product that kind of reminded you of, uh, you know, the old school wrestling. Oh, sure. Uh, Okada in Japan. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I started to say Daniel Bryan, but it's <laughs> Brian Danielson, the, the American Dragon. Gotcha. And um, yeah, he's uh, Roddy Strong is with AEW now. Yeah. The, well, Randy Orton, I think, yeah. is most. I hear some young guys say, oh, Orton's boring. What? He's a wrestler. <laughs> it's it, it all because he portrays a lot of the true bread and butter characteristics. It, it, unless you just talked about earlier. It, because it's, it, they, he, he doesn't go out doing 15 spots and open in one minute. And, and there's no selling whatsoever. I mean, the fact that they do these big killer moves, there's no selling. You pop right back on up and make it, oh, my God. He just makes everyone, everyone looks weak in this yeah, process. Just, just watched a match Wednesday night. Won't name any names. But one guy clotheslined the other guy almost out of his boots. I mean, the guy did a complete flip and came right back to his feet and won the match. Oh. I thought you would have got your butt kicked. 30 years ago, somebody had put their foot in your butt for sure. Well, you know, and the, these guys, Dan, what's the object of a wrestling match? To pin somebody, right? So yes. I finally get you on the mat. I turn my back and start uh, pandering to the crowd. Come on. Yeah. Well, well just, just like what you just said, to pin the man, every time that they actually pick up, they do that big move or boom, he crash bang, he's down on the, on the mat. Why isn't there the cover? All they do is they, they go over there and they pick them back, back up by the hair, grab them by the wrist. They pick them back up. I'm thinking, this doesn't make sense. You pick them up, you slam them. Why don't you just cover them and let's be done with it? Or Let even it worse, off. after he's down there, they back off and get in a stance like they're going to charge him. Why are you waiting for me? I never fought anybody that wanted me to get up. Right? I mean, where are those people? I want to fight them. Now. Yeah, no, they're they're living more and more into what I call the movie La La Land. It's like going, there's no there's yes. no reality base to this anymore. It's like going, we might as well get pull out our video games and just start playing with our thumbs here right now. That's what we're doing. When I was doing camps with Harley, uh, he would see some kid in a practice match, you know, get the not and turn his back. Harley'd say, "Hey." You know what I'd do if you'd have turned your back on me? What? I'd have knocked you on your ass is what I'd have done. That's the most insulting thing you can do to an opponent because you're saying he's nothing and I can turn my back on him. But again, these these are things that were physically taught to me years ago. They don't physically teach anymore. No. That's the problem, I think. You you would, you would actually, I, I told the story a little bit earlier here, but uh, at a different interview, but at my training facility in Coldwater, Michigan, I mean, my, my first love was just teaching amateur wrestling. But then I, got, I ended up getting involved in uh, uh, professional wrestling as of the 1984 uh, Olympic Games. Uh, a new rule that came down allowed athletes to be both amateur and professional simultaneously. I had a few offers, so I jumped in, into it on the independent scene. And uh, But I, I started realizing, because I, I love coaching amateur wrestling. I knew how to put together lesson plans and stuff like that. I went to a couple of different professional wrestling places and make a name there is no organization to this i'm thinking i could put together lesson plans and would make sense so actually at my training facility i actually had wrestling mats and the ring i had a ring there there as well right. but you had to you started out on the mats and you had to learn that there's a whole list of these are some basic type of ways of starting to move around on, on the mats, how to tie up, how to do goal behinds, how to take a person off their feet, take them down to the ground. And, and how, when you get up, always turn into your right so that your feet properly to your opponent, just some the basic fundamentals. Right. And then as they, as they felt comfortable, because I, I didn't put no pressure. going As you felt comfortable, you and one of the other trainees put together a match. And so their, their very first match I had uh, in, in my other room. I had actually, they were called blue mat, blue mat matches, only because the mat was blue, but the mat was the exact same size as a professional wrestling ring, minus the ropes, right. minus the turn post. Oh, going on there. So when you stepped on this mat, you had to be in character, and you had to wrestle. Your very first match was a bare bones minimum of five minutes. If it came up anything less, uh, automatic. Automatic failure. I don't care if it's a five-star match. Automatic failure. 
And with each progressive match, we added an additional minute to it so that you had to play more. Sure. And, and to me, it's like the whole purpose was to teach them how to wrestle. The marquee says professional wrestling. doesn't say professional kick, punch, chop. Okay. It right. says wrestling. Or, or dive. Right. <laughs> that it's not. Ne- well, you know, the, what they don't understand either is that the more you do something, the less important it becomes. The more they yeah. see it, you know. Uh, I've one of the things that I do a lot, I, I've got a sarcastic sense of humor, but if I'm doing a weekend camp and we're doing Q and a on Friday night, I'll say now for you guys go, how many guys here have a living girlfriend or married? Now, hold up your hand. Okay. I said, I've got a homework for you guys. Now, when you get home tonight, after, you know, you get ready to go to bed, say to your wife, Hey, we're going to make love tonight. And now when I touch you here, you start moaning and then we'll, and then, and then, I can see these guys starting to giggle, right? Uh, you know, uh-huh. he said, it's all right. You can laugh. I meant it to be funny, but I also am making a point. The point is, you know, your, your living girlfriend or your wife intimately, you know, her likes or dislikes or favorite food, it's et cetera, et cetera. Right. And you would never do this yet on Saturday night, you're going to a dressing room someplace and you and some other guy are going to lay out a 35 minute match, which takes you two hours to talk about. And for people you've never seen before in your life, how do you, how do you know they're going to care? And if they don't care, what the hell are you going to do? Yeah. That's why I, I wouldn't know how to lay a match out in a dressing room. Everything I've ever done in my life would call it on the fly. You know, the finish unless, or even a three fall match, you know, three finishes. And we're, I've gone an hour without, <laughs> you know, you're talking back and forth in the ring, and, but you've got to feel the crowd. And that's what they don't understand. Yeah. You, you, you're going to go out. You're going to go out there. Is I mean, were you billed as the heel or the baby face? And if, if we go out there, it's like, go make certain you do heel stuff. I'll make certain I do baby face stuff. And there should be some kind of like magic. I actually really wish I had been around during those territorial type days because you got the opportunity to work with the same guy over and over and over again before this little device, the cell phone came along and kind of like ruined it because it would have been so great to know that, okay, Harley, it's you and I get here tonight. Okay. Who goes over and how do you want, how do you want to do the finishes? Like going, okay, we're done talking about the match, aren't we? That would have been it. Yeah, you're right. Well, you know, uh, I ran four Pillman benefit shows in Cincinnati, uh, 98, 99, 2000, 2001. And on the two, uh, the 2000 show, uh, Chris Benoit worked with Steve Regal. Uh-huh. And I told Mike, they said, why are you putting that? I said, bring a notebook. You're going to, and you're going to school. That match was, if you, it's, it's out there on YouTube someplace. You get a chance to see it. Uh, it was, you could feel it building in the, we had like, uh, 2,300 people in the building. And, uh, I was squatting in front of the sa- uh, sound booth way back from the ring. By the time they got ready to go in their finish, I was down by the ring. I wanted to be in this match. The guys, the dressing room was in the basement. The guys could hear the crowd starting to build and they realized this, they're telling a story. And, and it was yeah. a wrestling match. It was a co- a competition between two athletes. And that's, that's all you need to do. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, uh, well, again, one dive once in a while. Okay. But, 14 in the same night, in the same show. Who cares? Right. Yeah. Well, I always looked at, I always simply just looked at the the flyers, especially, okay, you, you beat me up, you throw me out of the ring. Yeah. I'm out there. I, I, I wobble. I sell a little bit. I wobble around. And I said, I start turning towards the apron. The whole time you've been climbing up to the top turnbuckle and you're going, about to do a little swanton or whatever it is you're going to do. And I have got to be there. To save your bacon here in the process. Right. Because if I don't do my job where I take that full impact to my chest, fall backwards, and, and hopefully bring you down to that ground safely, otherwise you splat, and that's the end of your career. Yes. And that's where, again, I, I see some of these guys make these, well, again, because of the cell phone, I am I get set clips all the time, and you'll see that that uh, professional show was that was held at the local high school junior high. Right, and it's with these independent guys, and one guy climbs up this this I beam, and he's, he's he's up in the rafters, and he's about to jump off these rafters and hit a table, 
and misses the table and hits the floor. And into the match automatically right there. And now they're calling the paramedics because who knows what he just busted up on the inside. Or you see the one on YouTube where, where the, uh, they set the table on fire. Yeah. And the oh. guy dives, breaks the table and catches fire. And then everybody's around him trying to, you yeah. know, it's like, are you people just insane or you have a death wish or exactly, you know, and the crazy thing is, Dan, a lot of these kids actually don't know how to work. They yeah. might know how to wrestle, but they don't know how to work. I've locked up some of these kids and I'll back off and I say, are you mad at me? Huh? I said, damn. I said, I've been in street fights easier than this. Relax, loosen up. But what they don't understand was Hodge tough. I never felt him. I've gone Broadway with Danny Hodge and, and never, you know, never knew he was there. Harley, I never felt him. Uh, Bill Miller, right? Guys who legitimately were shooters. And, but that was, that was part of our credo when I broke into business. You protect your opponent. Yeah. You know, when I, if I put a hold on a kid, I'm selling it with my body language and my facial, not squeezing his arm to break it. Right. Yes. And when I, I'll say, Here, let me put a headlock on you and I'll put it on and I'll start working it myself. Right. My body language. I'll tell the kids, it's this right way. Oh yeah, that's good. I said, let him go. I said, tell him what you felt. I didn't feel anything. Exactly. That's, That's the, the whole you, story. It's the way you put your facial expressions on, the way that you're working your body, and yes. but, but then also knowing I have four different audiences to work towards because I have right. four sides of this ring. So that's where sometimes wrestlers they they're always selling to to the hard camera. You got four sides of this audience. Let the other people see there as well. If you really want to get over with the crowd and and, and have crowd participation, you got to sell to all four sides. Sure. You know, I want to bring this up, too, because I, when I knew I was going to be on with you, I the match that you worked with Chris Candido in uh, Florence, Kentucky. That, again, I – go ahead. I'll let you say what you're going to say. Mountain. Yes, yes. Okay. With, but that's with, when you dropped the title to Chris. No, uh, just uh, Chris dropped the title to me. Or Chris, that's yes, what yes, I – yeah. Yes, but yes. what I was going to say, and I've told other guys, that to me that night I knew Candido was good or was going to be better because he had wrestled Boo Bradley, who's just a puncher and kicker, earlier in the night before he wrestled Dan. So he had to shift gears like 180 degrees to wrestle Dan because this was all punch, kick, brawl, yeah. and, and that. And yet Chris never missed a lick and, and mm -hmm. made the switch, you know? No, it and was. Then, it was. Uh, I, I always I, I talk about that uh, a lot there because prior to that, I had never met Jim Cornette. Never met him. And never worked for honest companies, stuff like that. Never spoke to them over a phone, right. like that. And it was again someone in the NWA that should be they're, they're they're coming up with some kind of ideas of how do we re spark interest into the NWA and stuff like that. And I don't know if it was Dennis Carluzzo, I don't know if it was somebody else from the NWA that, that came up with this idea. But for Jim Cornette to allow me to come down to his, his territory, his Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And then to allow me to be the champ, champ. I mean, it spoke volumes. And and there was just other times that when I met him, when I was working for WWF, he was, uh, you know, he was so frustrated with the, uh, with the people that were trying to come up with this, with the storylines and stuff like that. They're like, Dan, they don't have a clue what to do with you. But he goes, he says, he goes, you're the greatest thing to hit professional wrestling because you're a wrestler. I, you're a wrestler who can wrestle. Yes. You know, he goes, I know you're not going to cut. Any promos? He goes, that's what you got my big mouth there for. He says, I'll do all the talking for you. You just, you're going to go out there and take, take care of business. That's all. So, right. right. And, and you know, that's what well, like people say to me, oh, you used to be a wrestler. Yes. What was, what, what was your gimmick? I said, I was a wrestler. <laughs> Look at me like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's another problem I see today too in the evolution. I don't know that it's an evolution. It's a change, but I'm not sure it's all for the good. But, you know, well, I, I used to, when Dusty passed away, I had some kids say, well, you knew Dusty. Tell me. I said, well, you know, one of the things I'm going to tell you is how tremendous Dusty was over in his time. Oh, but part of the reason was because there was only one Dusty. There mm -hmm. wasn't 45 other guys with a gimmick just like or near his. So he's well, you know, uh, Paul Jones was a wrestler. Uh, well, Flair had a gimmick, but still he was a wrestler. Right. Everybody. Blackjack Mulligan wore a cowboy gimmick, but he was a wrestler. Yeah. And everybody, now they want everybody to have a, 
a catchphrase, a gimmick, a hand signal or some damn thing. I'm like, who cares? When the bell rings, what does that mean? Yeah. Not, right? It's you can't go, you can't go. And yeah. some of these guys can't. I'm yeah. sorry, but they can't. There are guys making big paychecks in some of these companies that I'm thinking if when I had HWA, if they'd have come to me for work, I'd have said, mm, I don't think you're ready. Yeah, no, it's I think they're way, way too soon, and, and they're they are they should be just doing a little bit more. There's not you, you have to pay a little bit of a price. Yes, you didn't. I'm not talking about monetary. I, I look at in, in athletics, you the proverbial price you pay is called blood, sweat, and tears. Right, because you do there's, you, there's a lot of working out. That's that actually was one of the reasons why I always wore a gray T-shirt because to me the gray shirt represented where I came from, the sport of amateur wrestling, and I used to rate my workouts based upon a sweaty t-shirt and, and and a standard a standard workout for me for over a cup of a two-hour type of workout was a minimum of two t-shirts and on, on a on a really tough day three t-shirts but i don't mean just a little bit around the armpits right. a little bit of, i mean like you just pulled it out the wash machine it hasn't gone through the spin cycle here yet you know so right. it was it, right. it, big sloppy Lucy, a quick story about that um one night in Cincinnati, Benoit and Jamie Noble were off, right? And they came out to HWA and said, can we borrow one of the rings? And they borrowed the, the, the ring that wasn't being used for training. When they left, they were the kids were told, look at that ring over there. That canvas was ringing wet in the center. With these, And I said, these guys, this is their night off. Yes. <laughs> They're off tonight. So... And, that, you know, that's something these kids don't understand either. If they think they want to go to one of the major companies, well, let's say WWE, because that's the, the yardstick, yeah. I think, by this yeah. point in time. Uh, they got to find it's a much more intense life. And they, I don't, I'm not sure a lot of them can handle it, quite frankly. You know, it's well, you know, I mentioned breaking in in 1960. I've told a couple of these kids, I said, you know how long you would have lasted with me in Boston? Not, not with me, but with the people that train me. Maybe, maybe a week, maybe two. But you'd have been gone before because you, you know I wasn't going anywhere. I'm a hard-headed Irishman, and I was going to be a professional wrestler come hell or high water. And uh, but you know, it's they don't understand. It's it's a job. It's work. Yeah. Your body is your tool, and you got to well, take care of it. A, a Do lot you of think? Things well a lot of that is from lack of experience or, I mean, it seems like the downfall of the territories really had a lot to do with this as yeah. well, because they don't get to travel around and learn the different things like they used to. Yeah. Well, when uh, I, I've said that too, last year at, in Waterloo at, at the hall of fame induction, I said, how could I have not done something right? I wrestled some of the greatest in this business of all time. I sat with the commentators who were the Hall of Fame commentators. I had tag team partners that were, and, I, and the guys I worked in the ring against the heels, my God, half of them are in the Hall of Fame. If I hadn't learned something, I'd have been the biggest idiot in the world is all I can say. I mean, and that's these things. These kids, they want to work with somebody they know and they've been with 17,000 times. But I had a couple, uh, a couple kids that are, well, the one is, I think he's in uh, one of the companies now. I'm not sure if it's TNA or what. But anyway, these kids are out of Dayton, Ohio. And somebody brought them down and said, I want you to take a look at them. They were brothers. So uh, they were out in the ring when I came out of the office. And uh, I said, uh, they said, what do you want to see? I said, how about some chain wrestling? They looked at me like, uh, I said, whatever you do, do it. Okay. So I watched for about four or five minutes. And I turned around, started to go back to my office, and the guy brought him and said, hey, hey, where are you? I said, they have done this together so many times, what I just saw. They can do it in their sleep. I'm not interested. I said, if you want me to really look at them, bring them back when my guys are here, and I'll put them, each one of them in the ring with somebody they've never seen before in their lives. Then I will know right. what they can do, right? And, yeah. well, you know, I when I tell stories about the old days, some of the guys look at you like, uh, when I say Nelson Royal and I almost had a riot in Richmond, Virginia, and we worked 35 minutes, he used one hold and I used this other hold. We ran spots off of those holds, right? 
And it was like the veteran and, and the, uh, the younger guy, but he worked a uh, headlock for his half of the match. And then when I finally picked up the rhythm and, and took over, I was working the arm. So the finish was I've got the arm bar and he's bowling with me and finally gets me back against the ropes and referee Sam break, break. I don't want to break. He doesn't want to pull back. Referee ducks down and comes between us. And as he's ducking through Nelson steps back one shot, I pitch forward. The referee turns around. Nelly rolls me over, hooks a leg. We almost had a riot. <laughs> one punch in 35 minutes. <laughs> but it's not what you do. It's when. You do it. How you do it and then when you do it. Yes, yes. Wow, that, that, that was great. That was great. <laughs> Um, Les, I'm curious. Uh, you talked a good bit about Harley tonight. What kind of person was Harley Race, and how tough was he in real life? He was real tough in real life, but he was a teddy bear. I was. Uh, we we start. Uh, he and Steamboat and I were doing three uh, three day camps together back in the early 2000s, and uh, so I spent time in Harley's home and uh, with his him and his wife, and they have spent time in mine. And uh, I love him to death. I mean, but he's. He's a bull if he needs to be, but, uh, well, like telling those kids, uh, you know, if you'd have turned your back on me and what would have happened, I'd have knocked you on your ass. And I said, you don't want to see that big left hand coming at you. You really don't <laughs> because I first worked with Harley in Kansas city in 63. I was, uh, 22 years old and he was 19 at the time. Oh, wow. So we've been friends a long, long time. I love wow. him to death. I think one of the other aspects that was very, really, very endearing to him is because he always came out that portraying this common man lingo. Yeah. He was always related to the common man right. and hard, hard times because I mean, you know, it was it was a prosperous times when he right. was in there. So he he touched on this American heartstrings. So it, it was I think a very easy thing for a lot of people to get behind. Him. Oh yeah, we're with you there, Harley. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, I, I think most of the guys, uh, and I, you try to explain that to the younger generation. Uh, Roddy Piper was just an extension of himself. Flair yeah. who just cranked up Ric Flair's personality 10 times. That's all. You know, when I, when I was uh, training for WWE, we came up with it just for the hell of a, a, a drill. I usually had maybe four or five guys off the main roster who they needed to rest up there, right? So they sent them down to work and they've worked with my kids. So what we did, everybody put their name on a piece of paper, put it in a hat, and you draw a name, and you do that person's promo. Now, if you'd have heard Haku do Val Venus, that was <laughs> worth the price of the Oh, man. my God. <laughs> but the thing we found with the kids, the, the, con uh, the contract kids, was they could do Hulk Hogan, or they could do uh, Dusty, or they'd do, they couldn't do themselves. You know, they didn't understand that these guys are just being themselves plus, you know, uh, cranking it up 10 times or whatever. So, and, and that's it. You, I think that one of the problems today is somebody, I see kids and I'm sure you do too, Dan, who are you in a gimmick that they're not comfortable with and it never works for. Them. Yeah. And nobody told me how to be less Thatcher. You know, I just learned on, <laughs> On the yeah. job, basically. It'll be your your characteristics that are going to come through at some point in time. I'm, I actually, I, I I don't know why why it popped in my head. I remember one night where I'm just you know heading out to my my training facility, getting ready to open up the door stuff like that. I have one car that I already pulled up, and this gentleman gets out of his vehicle. He is already wearing his entire gimmick. He's got leotards on. He's he's got he's got. Uh, uh, you know, this, this tank top combination, he's got a cape on his back and stuff like this. And I'm thinking, can I help you? And he's like, well, yeah, he says, I'm here to meet Dan Severn and to uh, start professional wrestling training. And I, mean, and I mean, he literally, he's in his outfit. And uh, I go, well, I go, no one, uh, and I, again, I brought him in, I'm being cordial, so I brought him on in, make sure he gets all the legal liability waiver papers, stuff like that signed. And then, uh, you know, the rest of the class comes on in. And I'm just running, running through the basic fundamentals, or actually, I should say, I have a couple of the the, the the younger guys that are running him through some of the basic fundamentals about 
the basics of just bumping. But, sure. and, and he's bumping on, on just a, a wrestle mat, okay? Not in the ring, but on a wrestle mat, which is actually a lot more forgiving than what, what, what most rings are. He's out there, and, and he only lasts about the first 45 minutes of class. Well, he, well we, also, we also do an official warm-up stretch. They do about 10 minutes with the calisthenics, the warm stretch, because I'll make sure when it's loosed up before they, they actually go, start going crazy on each other. And literally, he doesn't even last the first hour of class. And he's headed for the door. I go, where are you going? He goes, and he, he said, like, what you said before. He goes, I thought this was all just a fantasy. I didn't think any of this stuff was real. I go, I go, professional wrestlers are some of the most incredible athletes doing some of the most incredible athletic maneuvers without the aid of a safety net. You have to be there to be the buffer for your partner, stuff like that. You have to be in this. I mean, and, and literally, he probably spent easily five hundred to a thousand dollars between boots and and all this crazy gear he had on, and that was the last <laughs> time seen of the guy. That was it. Poof. We had a guy show up in Vegas in a full costume and a mask. <laughs> Harley said, what are you doing here? I came to train. He said, you don't train dressed like that. Go back to your room and get in some sweats. Or don't come back, he said. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing, too. I, I think when I met, went to Boston at age 19 to start training, I believed, in the, I believed it was a shoot, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you see little things, but... They made me believe it. I mean, the guy's in the ring, right? But I think today these kids, oh, it's predetermined. It's all show. I can be an actor until they feel. It's like what Tyson says. You got to plan until somebody punched you in the mouth, right? right. They got to plan until they start taking bumps. Whoa, that hurt. Yeah. What's in there? Yeah. Well, it's, it, yeah. yeah they, it, it, go ahead. No, no I, all I'm going to say is that. Even a lot of the professional wrestlers, because I, I speak, uh, when they're taking bumps, a lot of them don't realize. I, I go, so when someone picks you up and drops you back, you know, learn to exhale, breathe out, you know, so yes. that if you if you try to hold it, it's, it's, it's going to knock the air out of you, and now you, it's going to be a lot more hurt. So I, I, I try to explain it. It's the same way of martial arts break falling, but a lot of, uh, a lot of professionals have never been taught it quite that same. Each time you make impact, try to come fall on the down, but you want to make impact like a slap with the arm, slap with the leg. I go, I said, it will help to dissipate the, all the, the force right. and stuff like I that. I just told so, a kid that the other day. I said, this is not for ex exhibition. This is to help dis dispense the, uh, the, yeah, the fall. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know what I've thought? We were talking about evolution a, a few minutes ago. When MMA first became, started to get popular, I'm thinking now some of these kids, because – if you watch MMA and then you watch pro wrestling, you figure out which is which, right? And this is yeah. a shoot. Yep. And this probably is not. But I said, would it make some sense to pick up some M uh, MMA moves, right? In a working manner, but to make it look, you know, but something that make it a little more le legitimate. Yep. Uh, Rod Roderick Strong, you ever met him? No. Okay. He's with AEW now, but he, he was with uh, Ring of Honor for several years. He's a good little wrestler. And, uh, oh, I'm thinking of this other kid. Um, they use some MM, you know, like this, some of the kicks and stuff. Well, uh, uh, Ryan Danielson does as well. But to me, again, I, I watch some of the stuff and I think, why am I watching this? Because I do a podcast. That's why I'm watching. It's like I've got to talk about it. But I don't say always say nice things because no, I you you're, but you're being honest there. I mean that's and what they don't want that right? either. Right? Well, that's, that's, well, well, that's, they said the wrong people. podcast if they think they're I am not here to kiss anyone's hind den here in the in the process. I'm I'm like uh I, I'd rather just hit real you know, hurt hurt your feelings with the truth and we, we either move forward or we say adios to each other at, at that point in time. But it's uh I always tell people I sleep well at night, you yeah. know. And when I got criticized. Uh, as a young guy, you know, when they said you need to do this, I took it as a challenge. To, you know, if they said you're not doing this well, by God, I'm going to learn to do it well. You yeah. know, it, it's I'm trying to improve because I want to move up. And and some of these guys, they're not interested in how how it looks. They're having fun. I said, look, those people are paying money for you to entertain them, not to entertain yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and some of these guys are, oh, that's such a cool move. I'm going to do it 15 times. Right. Yeah. 
And, and did we do anything back in the day that wasn't really logical? Yes, but we only did it once and got the hell away from it. Yeah. These yeah. guys will do it 15 times in a row and blind man can almost figure out what they're doing if, if well, they walk close enough. But you, you said at first at the very beginning of the conversation, they're not listening to the crowd. Right. Yeah, it's going that they're they're so fixated on completing the match that they had in in the locker room that they're not reading that that crowd. You you got to you got to learn to change on up with with yeah. things. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And and that's I always that's how you build a match. Well, you and I could have a match, say in Knoxville tonight, and tear the roof off the place. Go to Nashville tomorrow night, the same match, and the people sit on their hands. We better be able to change what we're doing and and yeah. go in another, another direction. And that was a great thing. You mentioned territories. Going to it every time you change territories, it was like going to another college. Yeah. Right. Different wrestlers, different style, but they were all. And I think too that today the kids will say, "Oh, you old guys are just bitter because you can't do <laughs> right." Okay. What was the What was the last riot you were in? <laughs> if yeah. you had to drag a heel out from under a pile of fans, you know. These kids will never have to worry about having a riot. That's for damn sure. I, I think one of the most comical things I saw that almost erupted into a riot, I, I was down to a southern territory, and they were having a lumberjack match. But this literally, this was a very unique thing. They actually did fan participation. Oh, shit. So they actually that was a hardcore match. I oh bet. my god! It, it, I mean, but but these these two wrestlers they were dressed in I mean like, like sweatsuits because they knew they were gonna and and, and each of these these uh, uh the people on there I mean it, it was vicious because they knew they were gonna go out at different times into over over the over the rings through the ropes whatever and right. who, that, them them people that that got that paid the extra money to be the lumberjack they were beating a tar. Out of these wrestlers, I'm making. Oh my God, this is this is worse than any shoot I've ever been in. <laughs> right. yes. I went to one once uh, down in Carrollton, Georgia, where they allowed the audience members to get belts and hit the wrestlers. I was like, I've never seen anything like this. Or uh, what? Uh, I'm trying to think of the company uh, in Lexington, uh, Ian Rotten's ICW in uh, Louisville. Yeah, right. They had fans bring the weapons. Yeah, what? That brought old old. VCRs and and just all sorts of craziness, right? They uh, when Eddie Gilbert passed away, Ian did a, a benefit show, and so his dad and his brother were there, but Terry and Dory Funk were there as well, right? And there's a match going on in the ring, and Dory's standing next to me, and uh, he looks down, and he sees these sheets of plywood with the uh, neon tubes, right, in them. He said, "What's that for?" I said, later, the kids are going to go through those. Oh, no, seriously, what are they for? I said, Dory, that is what they are for. They're going to body slam guys on that. Oh, my God. He said. Yeah. No, I've, I've, I've witnessed a few of those, those shows where th thumbtacks, uh, how do they go? Ladders, chairs, and... Tables, ladders, and chairs. Oh, my. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, like going, I, I'm not going to climb up on, on top of a ladder. First off, I have a fear of height. <laughs> so it's like going, that ain't happening for me. In, in I, I do, too. I, I've done some missile drop kicks off the top rope, but sparingly. Yes. <laughs> sparingly. <laughs> you needed to, well, you didn't really need to see it. Uh, this kid, Darby Allen, who's with AEW. Yeah, I'm familiar with him. Not a big kid. He's Okay. Uh, and their big show, uh, he dove off, I think it was a 12-foot ladder. It was up in the ring, out onto a sheet of glass. I saw that, yeah. That was oh. laying on, across folding chairs. Thank God he went down on his back. And, but he had glass stuck in his back. He was cut. I thought, are why? you Why? Why? Insane or what? I don't, well... But what? How do you follow that? And I mean, why do you, you know? And I don't think they understand that either. Is the more goofy it gets, the more goofy you're going to have to get because at some point, well, you remember when tables were a big deal, right? Now they're just part of the show, yeah. right? Like you know, a snap. I've, I've, I've been in a, in a main event before, and the semi-main event goes out there, and they're doing 
just all the stuff you just described. They got chairs. They got thumbtacks. They got th- fluorescent those three foot long fluorescent bombs. They smashed it over top of each other. And I go right up to who I'm wrestling that night. And I go change of plans. We're not leaving our feet because there's going to be thumbtacks. There's going to be glass. I'm not going to be getting cut up uh, for nothing. I don't care what the payday is right now. I said, I said, you will be in the ring for just a little bit. I said, one way or the other, we're going to go out of this ring. We'll work around the ring. We'll come back in the ring just enough to go out of the ring again. I go, I'm not going to take a single bump in this ring because I'm not going to get cut up. The one thing that uh, I I like that the fact that state athletic commissions got after the professors. I, I, I don't, I'm, the money thing and stuff like that, or, or that, that they fell underneath uh, the auspice of uh, um, professional, well, let's see, of the state athletic commissions, only to the, the fact that they should have had physicals, yes, and blood tests. That's all I cared about, the knowing that these athletes are at least are healthy and they've had the blood test, so they we know that they're uh they're physically capable to do it, and they're they're HIV, Hep B, Hep C clean, right? You know, because again, I, I was getting basically every thirty days, I had to go get new blood tests because I was fighting practically every other month, so I had to do that for my MMA career. And and certain uh, professional wrestling companies, they still fell underneath the, the, that, so I I use the same paperwork that I'd show them at the same time. Because I want to know that if someone's bleeding on me and I'm bleeding, I want to know that they're clean. I don't want to be walking, coming, bringing something back home. Right. You know? Of course, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, blade jobs were, hey, an extra 25 bucks. Yeah. If you get, if you get juice, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was not. But, but like you say, with HIV and, and all that crazy, uh, man, yeah, that's it's scary. I yeah. think now to use it just sparingly. But AEW has gotten crazy with it. Yeah. WWE doesn't use it all because they're looking at a corporate image. I know what that's about. Yeah. But uh, I think, well, you know, when you <laughs> I, have I, had, I had to laugh for a moment there. I go, are, are they really looking at a corporate image? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, well, we'll let that not, go. Not, we'll not, not what you're seeing in the headlines uh, in the newspapers. No, yeah. they're not. Yeah. We, they're working on a, a lot of other finishes that are that's yeah. a different type of wrestling here right now, but yes. we'll, we'll, we'll let that all go. Big money yeah. finishes, I think, too. Like lawsuit <laughs> finishes, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, my but, God. Yeah. Well, you know, but seriously i think uh if you guys the bloodline thing is is as close to the stories that you know the long run drawn out uh yep. angles and stories we used to do because it has been over two years and in that court roman is it's a lot of with him it's a lot of his facials right mm-hmm. i mean he's in great shape and he's a good big guy he's a good worker but it's his facials and and a lot of that that these kids so why is he so over? Why, you know, but he'll get a twitch, right? If he's mad, he won't scream like a a, a wild heel or anything. But you'll you'll you know, oh, damn, Roman's getting ready to blow, right? But yeah. what you know, I watch I watch two or three shows a week because I you know want to talk about some guys. That's all they want to talk about on podcast. But when that started, I I'm following it. I'm all of a sudden I think. I'm turning on SmackDown because I actually want to, not because I need to. And if they've drawn me in, this is damn good. <laughs> it's, and, but I was so used to just being half-assed, you know, uh, the, what I was watching. But yeah, and and out of that, Sami Zayn started out almost as a comedy character. And he wanted to be part of the bloodline, which he's obviously not Samoan or Hawaiian or anything else. And uh, everybody's saying, kick his butt watch now gotta watch next week they're gonna kick his of course he becomes a i mean there's a long story but the point is he was a mid carter when this started and he can now work a main event Mm. they turned him in what a hot baby face they are right now for me deep in talent like they're in a position like one of the territories that was red hot back in the day right oh they're gonna fall i mean there's there's peaks and valleys but right now it's almost like they couldn't make a mistake if they tried. I mean, they're going to be little mistakes, but they're so hot, they'll be covered up, you know. Mm-hmm. But they've, they've made more out of that, and still now Rock is involved. And I'm he, in this WrestleMania, they've got great promo guys. That's part of it, too. Roman's a good promo guy. Cody Rhodes is a good promo guy. 
uh, Seth Rollins, et cetera, et cetera. So they're deep in good workers and good promo guys. So they're going to be on top for quite a while, I think. Uh, Les, how often are you doing your podcast? Uh, we On fr- uh, Fridays. It's on uh, Meltzer's uh, on the, uh, Observer site. So you got to be a subscriber there. They had put us out. I, I thought they were going to put us out on uh, uh, like Apple and, and uh, the, you know, some of the regular uh, uh, open to the public. And they did for a few weeks and then pulled it back for some reason. I guess it wasn't creating what they expected or, or something like that. I've told uh, Vic Sosha is my co-host and producers. Vic is an overnight DJ at iHeartRadio in New York City. Oh, wow. And uh, but a uh, great guy and a, and a great wrestling fan. And we, he and I've been together for mm, almost 13 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. I actually did the first podcast I ever did was in 2005. Who was that? Uh, I don't even know what network was on. I wasn't even cyber smart back then, right? <laughs> the guy, uh, the, this Doc Young man, he's, he passed away a few years ago. Doc Young started this, and I'd been a guest on a podcast, and and he was a producer, and he called me a few weeks later and said, uh, "I'd like to do a podcast. Would you try it?" And I, okay, why not? You know, we'll see. So I started with him, and we did some, and then. He got sick, went to, uh, and then when he came back from the illness, he called me. He said, I got, I can get us on uh, the Observer site if you go with me again. I said, sure. So when he, as the sickness started to come back, he, I forget what it was. It was something that was, it was eating his, his body was eating itself internally, right? Yeah. And so when his voice was about to fail, uh, he contacted Vic. And so Vic came on and we picked, we, we just kept it going from there. We still call it Doc's Young's wrestling weekly you know after after doc but uh yeah i'd I'd like to go public with it you know and and do something i think uh be a lot of fun i i and and the video see we're all we do in fact when he calls me tomorrow morning we're going on the phone you know we're not even on on video on uh, the observer site so uh but yeah i i well you know like uh memorabilia you can show on camera and stuff and talk uh you know, stuff like that, old pictures. There's a I lot see your of posters things. back there. I like those. Huh? I see the wrestling posters behind you. Yeah. Yeah. You see this one over here? No, yep. that one over there. I, I'm I am turned around. The, the this I see the one uh Roger Kirby would be to your left. Yeah, that's yeah. Kirby and I against the Andersons. That was Lars and Gene Anderson. That was in '66. Uh, okay. You mentioned Columbus, Georgia. Yep. You can't see the top of the poster, but that's, I think it was Columbus. Let me turn around and see. Uh, Carrollton. Carrollton. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yes, Carrollton. Yeah. Yeah. And the other one, you see Pat Patterson wrestling a guy named Les Milady. Okay. That's me. That's my real last name. Oh, wow. And that is the Pat Patterson of, of uh, Hall of Fame. We were both kids just getting started. We're talking about idols as a kid. Uh, Pat's idol back then was Kowalski. And if you uh, ever followed any of it, Kowalski always wore purple, right? And when I first met Pat in 61, purple shoes, purple trunks, purple robe, he was a Kowalski guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. You, you don't see too many people that, that don the purple. Uh, yeah, nowadays. yeah. Well, I, you know, I wanted to copy Buddy Rock. And, you know, talk about critiquing people. When I was up in Boston, uh, Mr. Santos, the, the guy uh, uh, that owned the comp- uh, promotion I trained with, uh, had me driving some of the stars he'd bring in around to the towns, right? So I picked up Pat O'Connor. And so uh, one night I was working on the car to Revere Beach, Mass. And uh, Pat was watching my match. So I came back, I said, and I hadn't been in the business then, maybe six months, seven months, something like that. And I said, what do you think? He said, well, I saw Don Eagle. I saw Buddy Rogers. And he named a couple other guys. In other words, things that I picked up off of TV, right? He said, when do I get to see less? And I thought, okay, I think he just scored a point here that I've got to become myself and not copying, you know, everything I see from, from other people. Ah, nice. So, yeah. One of my teaching tools when I teach 
I mentioned Buddy Rogers, is the O'Connor Rogers match from Comiskey Park, 1961, where Buddy won the title from Pat. I mean, that's a it's a great match, two masters, and uh, I I it, but you know that's another thing about these kids. I'm a, a trainer that I know uses a old match of Harley Race and Terry Funk. It runs about 40 minutes. So just naming those two guys, you know, it's a damn good match. Yeah. And he uses his teaching tool. At the end of one of the, watching that, one of the students said to him, that was boring. Oh, my God. I said, did you throw him out or what exactly did you do with it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> but you know, the problem, and there's the other, I think, part of the problem with the, today's too, is the, for the younger generation, uh, the past is the day before yesterday. I studied, I, I mean, I, I read about Jack Pesek and, and Sandow and, you know, you know, all the old timers and knew, knew of my name and, and the whole nine yards. And these kids, they know Hulk Hogan, right? Yep. Mm. When you talk about some of the guys you've worked with, uh-huh, who's that? Right? And, and they should, to me, well, I heard this story, uh, Dr. Death, his book, book that he wrote, he went up, uh, they, WWE had him go to OVW for a couple of weeks, right? As a, like assistant trainer. So he had taken copies of his book and passed it out to all students. He said, now the next time I come back, there'll be a, there'll be a, a quiz. Well, the quiz made him find out that half these kids didn't read the book. <laughs> Okay. But, but after he got done playing with them in the ring, they wished they had. But, you know, that's the other thing, too, I think, Dan, is respect for the people that came before you. Yeah. Nobody had to teach that to me. I mean, I'm looking around. The first dress, first television dressing room I ever walked into in Indianapolis in 1962. In that dressing room was Fritz von Erich, Dick mm -hmm. the Bruiser, the original Sheik, Art Nelson, Joe Blanchard. Wow. And I'm thinking, do I belong here? I mean, what you do? I went and sat down and minded my own business. Exactly what I did until someone spoke to me. I minded, I knew who I was and why I was in my pecking order, right? These kids don't know that. They don't have yeah. food. I had a monster factory up in New Jersey. And I was running, he had two rings set up. I was running one of them. I forget what drill we were doing. But anyway, this one kid wasn't doing a move the way we should. I said, Finally, he said, but that's the way I do it. I said, not here this is not the way you do it. This is my ring. And you're it's one of two things. We can stay here all day until you do it my way or you can get the hell out of here. And then I felt kind of bad that I, you know, jumped on the kid. So before at the end of the, the weekend, I went up to him. I said, hey, I'm sorry. Oh, no. He said, that's great. I can tell people I was chewed out by a legend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, there there has to be some kind of basic fundamentals you have to be teaching because it, it's it's just sure. certain fundamentals. Because I tell people, watch after they take the very first lesson at my trade facility, I'll say, now go back and watch professional wrestling. And and like like I was going to stop them in the first place. They'll watch it, but they'll they'll now watch it with renewed eyes. They're right. looking for just little nuances here right now and like in each week it's just like as they learn a little bit more i'll give them another little homework assignment again while you're watching tv look for this look for that you mentioned right. something a little bit earlier about you know mma and uh, some of the athletes there and you are you're starting to see more and more of a movement of some guys that are leaving the mixed martial arts and now they're going to cross over into professional wrestling to try to extend their careers a right. little bit longer, and uh, I think I think it's it's a good rub for each other. You know, I mean, I mean, we got look at UFC and WWE are now underneath the same umbrella, so it makes total sense to do that. And you're seeing sure. even more amateur wrestlers, especially when like at the heavyweight weight class, um, they're looking into professional wrestling as well. Sure, sure, exactly. But yeah, I, I think a lot of the old stuff they'll say that's ancient or. But it's, it's just respect for the people that came. You know, I would have never said to some guy, I don't do it that way. Not unless I want to get punched in the mouth or, or something, you know. And uh, 
it's just, I don't know. It's a different time. And, and well, I'm a wrestler now. You've been doing this how long? Oh, 15 minutes. Okay, good. Then you're the guy. <laughs> what yeah. can you teach me? Right. I mean, it's, it's great. Plus, a lot of these kids don't know what a weight room looks like. Never mind actually uses one. Yeah. No, it's less. I, I, I mean, I could sit there and just chat with you all, all day on this. I, I want to be respectful of your time and stuff like that. Uh, I would like to kind of do some, maybe some type of continuation here, you know, maybe another month or two down the road. But if someone wants to reach out to you for anything, maybe if they're sponsored, what you do with, with your own podcast, stuff like that, is there a good email or something like that? What's the best Les, way for someone to contact you? LesThatcher28 at gmail.com. Okay. And they can reach me there. Um, now, we're doing a, a – uh, a three-day camp in Kingsport, Tennessee, the last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of April is called Wrestling for the Kingdom, and it's a Christian-based organization. And nice. uh, I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know George South? I, I know the name. I can't pick, I can't pull a, a face right. out. Well, he it. actually is a minister, but he's an old old salt wrestler as well, right? And a tra- well, he trained. He's trained a lot of guys. He's based in Charlotte. Uh huh. He trained uh, Tessa Blanchard and uh, a lot of Flair's kids started with him and, and that sort of thing. But uh, G- George is going to be one of the trainers. And then we're doing a camp uh, induction weekend in Waterloo this year. Uh, that's the 18th, 19th and 20th of July. And on that Saturday, we're doing a training camp uh, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, in ring. And it's going to be myself, Tom Pritchard. Um, Gerald Briscoe, and I think Joe Malenko, and maybe some of the other guys too. I don't know for sure. But yeah, I enjoyed, you know, right now, a few of the guys that I've worked with are in good spots. John Moxley in AEW, uh, LA Knight in uh, WWE. But a lot of these, to me, I enjoy watching the guys grow that really put their hearts and souls into it, you know. And, and well, like LA Knight has just got red hot this time up, but I said, he's an overnight success, but it took him 15 years to be an overnight success. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw him when he first started in HWA and uh, I thought this kid's got a lot on the ball. Well, let, let's, I get it. Don't mean to cut you off at that point. I'm honored, a pleasure. And uh, my honor, my friend, it, 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 it will be, uh, we'll, it, we'll make sure that we, that we get something up on the, uh, on the screen there that will have how to contact you for any kind of like sponsorship, a little more about what your, your camps that you have coming up, stuff like that. All the best to you, my friend. I hope to see you down, down the road here somewhere. You guys, I've enjoyed Eric. My pleasure to meet you, Daniel. Take care of yourself. Don't hurt any of those kids that you're trying to make into good. <laughs> no, just stretch them a little bit, just a little well, bit. Well, just a lot. They squeal, but don't make them cry. Okay. <laughs> you guys take care. Thank you guys. Yes. So All much. right. Take care now.